Thank you for joining this uh, PCR Spotlight. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Gabriel Steg. Professor Steg is the head of the uh, uh, cardiology service at the Bichat Hospital in Paris, France. He's also directing a large research unit on atherothrombosis and he's uh, animating a huge international consortium on vascular research. Welcome, uh, Gabriel. Thanks for joining. Hello. Now, you have an interventional background. You're, of course, very well known as a trialist. You've contributed major trials in the treatment of acute and chronic coronary disease. But I wonder, you know, the theme of this conversation is trials against COVID. So how and why did you engage in this field? Yes, well, there are essentially two reasons. Uh, the first one is I work in a network of academic hospitals in the greater Paris region of 39 academic hospitals called Assistance Publique Hôpitaux de Paris, which happens to be the largest single institution uh, in Europe for academic hospitals. And I'm the vice president in charge of research. And so Naturally, when we uh, were faced with the COVID epidemic, the issue of research rapidly surfaced as a priority. And um, I was tasked to coordinate the effort with my colleague Yazdan Yazdanpana, who is a very, very well-known, uh, one of the most famous French infectious diseases specialists who also works at APHP, Assistance Publique Hôpitaux de Paris. Uh, I think another reason I was uh, tasked to do this is because I am a cardiologist, I was not directly involved in the field, probably uh, unconflicted with respect to making decisions between the various teams that were competing for support, uh, subjecting proposals and, uh, and seeking uh, financial support as well. So it was a good thing to have a non-infectious disease specialist work in the coordination of the research effort. It was a, it was, it was quite, difficult, I, I may say, because as you know, um, this is very challenging to have to uh, plan research for a disease that is emerging, which you know will hopefully last only a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, three months. And so you have a very short time interval to think about what you want to test, um, set up trials, and urgency that is that was and still is uh, with us which made it uh, uh, quite a challenge um, i've never seen such a thing in clinical research to have um, research personnel research support personnel statistician methodologies clinical research assistants on top of the scientists themselves and the clinicians work seven days a week uh, almost 24 hours a day to have approval by irbs on sundays uh, with a 48-hour delay uh, between submission and approval to have uh, the whole process between the idea of a study and enrollment of the first patient completed in less than 10 days. I've never seen this. Understood. That's amazing. So from, from, that, from where you stand, you must have um, a broad understanding of what's going on in France and, and worldwide, and also maybe you have ideas about what might or might not work. So you alluded already to strategic decisions you, you have to make. So can you tell us a bit about, you know, for this particular virus, what did you identify as, you know, potentially the most successful targets for potential therapies? Yeah, so um, before I go on with the therapies, um, there are a number of challenges uh, in, uh, in uh, doing these trials for uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is that it is not easy to decide what is your, going to be your endpoint, because you're facing a, a, a whole spectrum of populations that are sick. You have outpatients whom you know are going to be cured spontaneously in 98.5% of the time, and therefore it's quite challenging to test treatments in a population that will heal spontaneously 98.5% of the time. Then you have patients who are admitted for pneumonia or severe disease. And then you have patients who get sicker 
typically after a week or 10 days, they get a cytokine storm, a, a, an abrupt inflammatory storm, and then some of them uh, require uh, uh, to go to the ICU to be uh, artificially ventilated, sedated. And we know that the severity of this becomes very high. There's a high lethality rate. And of course, the endpoints for ICU patients that are ventilated will be death or length of ventilation, whereas the endpoints for outpatients will be need to go to the hospital or clinical severity scores. Um, sometimes even the persistence of the virus in uh, uh, PCR uh, testing. But of course, there can be sometimes a disconnect between all of these indices of severity, which explains the difficulty that we have in interpreting the results in the literature of some of the studies. Now, with respect to the various targets uh, and, and ways to address this, um, two things. First of all, because of the emergency status of this disease, um, it is uh, unrealistic to think that the first wave could be treated uh, effectively with new agents that would be designed specifically against this agent. It had to be some form of repurposing of existing agents. We know that development of new agents require 6, 12, 24 months of development and regulatory approval, and there was absolutely no way this could be achieved in the very short, short time frame of the epidemic. So what clinicians were faced with is the need to use older drugs that are existing, sometimes very old drugs, sometimes recent drugs designed for other viral, viral diseases, such as HIV or uh, chikungunya or MERS-COVID or whatever, Ebola, and to try their luck at testing these existing drugs in this new disease. And of course, you know, it's like boxing in the dark. You're trying to hit your target, but you're really not sure Sure, what where the target is. Um, the second thing is we can classify the various interventions uh, in broad categories. The first category is, is our antiviral agents. This is a viral disease, and of course, you want to test antiviral agents. Um, generally, for antiviral agents to be effective, you need to give them quite early in the disease, which was not easy because even getting a diagnosis confirmed with PCR, uh, often required 48 hours uh, during the early stages of the pandemic. And so you're, you're faced with this conundrum that you, you need to treat patients with you know, effective drugs, sometimes toxic drugs. You wanna have con a confirmation of the disease and even that already takes 24, 48 hours, sometimes even longer. Uh, the term time of test was a challenge. Now, with respect to the antiviral agents, we have a small number of agents that are available. We have a combination antiviral agents that have been tested for HIV, which can be in combination. It's a drug called Teletra, or even combined with interferon, interferon gamma. And there is um, there's probably a few randomized trials available, but there is a small Chinese randomized trial that, that did not find a statistically significant benefit of this combination. Although it was a small trial, and I think it's noteworthy that there was a 6% difference in survival between the treatment arm and the control arm, suggesting that potentially had the trial been larger, maybe that difference might have become significant. It's always the issue with underpowered trial. You're never sure of a negative. Your absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and we can't rule out that this treatment might be effective in a large larger uh, trial in uh, ongoing larger randomized trials. Uh, another agent is a drug called Favipiravir, which is a Japanese antiviral agent. There's a very small trial conducted in China that suggested potential efficacy of this drug, but I think it was on 35 patients, so it's really a very, very small trial. Again, larger ongoing efforts uh, uh, are uh, being conducted to try to tease out whether this might bring benefit. There is remdesivir, which is a Gilead's uh, antiviral agent. Um, the results of the uh, largest randomized trials came out last night in The Lancet, um, or in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, it's a trial that tested a little over a thousand patients and showed a shorter time to improvement 
in the treatment arm compared to the control arm, and no statistically significant difference in mortality, although numerically survival was better in the remdesivir arm. But the confidence interval for the uh, treatment effect ranges from, I think, 47% to 107 or 104. So it's not formally statistically significant. And there's a lot of discussion as to whether it was appropriate for the U.S. regulatory authorities to recommend that treatment based on the existing results. Uh, suffice to say that the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. agencies have recommended remdesivir for treatment. Uh, I think there will continue to be ongoing debate. And fortunately, more randomized trials are ongoing that are testing this drug and will uh, hopefully provide more evidence. Maybe the results of these trials can be combined in a meta-analysis to help tease out whether there is efficacy or not. Uh, finally, hydroxychloroquine uh, is a drug that's used for uh, malaria as well as for some anti as an anti-inflammatory agent in some rheumatoid diseases. Uh, and it's been touted to have an antiviral efficacy in vitro. Indeed, in vitro it does. In vivo, it has been tested in a host of diseases in the past, uh, including um, the chikungunya disease, for instance, and it has not proven clinical efficacy. In fact, in chikungunya, uh, lethality and uh, outcomes were worse in the treatment arm than in the control arm with hydroxychloroquine. But as I'm sure uh, everybody is aware, there's been tremendous interest worldwide including from President Trump, on hydroxychloroquine as a potential treatment. Um, I have to say the evidence we have so far is quite disappointing. Um, there's a lot of observational studies, including a very large observational study that came out a couple of days ago in The Lancet that didn't show efficacy, but observational studies can be very misleading. There are a number of small randomized trials that are disappointing, and many more are ongoing. And we will, I think we will have the final word on this surprised hydroxychloroquine were to be effective. First of all, it's been used, and if it were very effective, we probably would know already, even with observational designs. And second, pharmacologically, for the drug to be effective, uh, the levels that have to be achieved in the plasma have to be much higher than what oral uh, administration can achieve at the doses that have been tested. So I think that there's a lot of skepticism now with this agent. And on top of this, as cardiologists, we are well placed to know that there is potential toxicity due to QT prolongation and the risk for tosade de pointe and uh, uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, especially in patients who may, might receive other agents that increase QT, such as uh, some of the other antiviral agents or azithromycin, especially in COVID patients who tend to have low potassium due to the COVID infection. Uh, older patients that may have cardiac comorbidities. And therefore, I think that really this drug should absolutely not be tested outside of clinical trials. And I think there's even an ethical question as to whether this should continue to be tested in future randomized trials. As you know, there's a very large number of randomized trials that are going worldwide on COVID, more than 600. And I think that there are more than 80 that are devoted to hydroxychloroquine. And when you look back at the rationale for this, it's quite tiny and quite minute. So I'm not sure this is the way of the future. So this is what we have so far for antiviral agents, not, not a very large armamentarium. The other categories of drugs that we're looking at are, would be widely quoted as anti-inflammatory agents or anti-cytokine agents. As I previously alluded to, um, between days seven and 10 after the first symptoms, some patients will develop a, an abrupt increase in inflammatory markers, abrupt inflammation, uh, a cytokine storm, and it's been shown that IL-6, IL-1, and other cytokine will go through the roof, and they will, under, they will experience sudden clinical deterioration and often uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome and require uh, to go to the ICU and mechanical ventilation. And we know that this becomes very, very dangerous with a poor prognosis at that stage. And uh, it became quite clear, uh, even in the first few days of the epidemic, that maybe anti-inflammatory agents might be useful in these categories of patients. And there are a host of such anti-inflammatory agents that are available. Um, Anakinra is an anti-IL-1. Uh, uh, tocilizumab and sarilumab are anti-IL-6, 
And there are other monoclonal antibodies directed against many of the molecules that participate in this, in this cytokine storm that are being tested, eculizumab, bevacizumab, and uh, there's a lot of imagination with scientists, so there are many, many ongoing that are if we focus on the results of randomized trials that have been published, the fact is we have no results yet. What we have is anecdotal evidence from non-randomized studies that suggests that maybe there is efficacy here. But again, I think we have to be humble and recognize that neither for the antiviral agents nor for the anti-inflammatory agent, we won't have a magic bullet. We probably will not have a single agent that cures 80, 90% of the people uh, as uh, is something that we've been accustomed to in other infectious diseases. If you give anti-tuberculosis agents to somebody with tuberculosis, generally they will heal. Here, this is a more complex disease that we're just learning to, uh, uh, to face. And uh, what we're expecting are reductions in improvement in outcomes, uh, but certainly not a cure-all uh, uh, treatment. There are other options that are on the table for uh, uh, COVID. One option is to uh, have specific or non-specific immunoglobulin infusions. And it makes a lot of sense because uh, by many aspects, some forms of the disease are quite similar to uh, uh, the, the diseases that are being uh, cured by these infusions. So one way is to give non-specific immunoglobulin infusion as you do in Guillain-Barré syndrome, for instance. Another method is to infuse convalescent plasma into uh, sick patients. And there are several anecdotal reports from China, from Italy, from the US, that suggest that this might be effective. There are ongoing randomized trials. I think we will have an answer from this. Uh, this seems a, a very uh, promising approach at least from the anecdotal reports, that there might be a substantial improvement uh, clinically in some of these quite sick patients. It's not for anybody, it's not for outpatients, it's for patients who are in the hospital, but it might avoid the need for uh, mechanical ventilation, ICU, and uh, avoiding ARDS in a substantial fraction of patients. So I think it's a, it's a quite promising strategy. A derived strategy of this is to have specific immunoglobulins targeted against SARS-CoV-2, uh, a couple of startup companies have tried to uh, test this. There's a, an Israeli company that's developing this strategy. Um, I'm not aware of the exact development stage where they are at now because uh, no randomized trial results have been published, but I know this is being explored. And we could uh, somewhat liken this to uh, immune boosting strategies that are also ongoing. There are therapy in patients who might be exposed to the virus to prevent infection, a non-specific immune boosting. And that gets us to the last stage of therapy, which would be development of vaccine. Uh, so there are many efforts to develop a vaccine. Uh, uh, as of today, there are probably close to 100 different vaccines that are being uh, uh, worked on worldwide. It's a race but it's a race that we should expect to be quite long. It's not gonna be a 100 meter dash, it's gonna be a marathon. And even under the best of circumstances, if everything goes smoothly, if the, re the regulatory agencies are quite flexible, uh, I think we have to realistically know that it's gonna take a year for a vaccine to be developed and available for clinical use. So we're talking about something that will be available in 2021 and certainly not during the fall. And um, so that, that is going to be a, a long-term effort. Um, some people are quite optimistic about development of an effective vaccine. Some are more skeptical based on uh, the features of this infectious disease. I'm no, not an expert to make a decision, but it is obvious that this would completely change the picture of this pandemic if next year a, a vaccine were to be available. Great, this is a fantastic overview. Um, perhaps one additional question on, on this front. Um, there is a lot of confusion, at least in my mind, on the interaction between the renin-angiotensin system and the virus um, yeah. in terms of risk factor and perhaps also therapeutic targets. Can you clarify that? 
Yes, so this, is, uh, this has been a point of uh, major interest for cardiologists because um, the uh, gateway for the virus to get into cells is um, the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, type 2. And therefore, there were concerns when the epidemic stand started that uh, maybe uh, drugs that interfered with the system might be deleterious. And some even advised to discontinue ACE inhibitors or ARBs and replace them with other agents. Uh, at the same time, uh, other pharmacologists and virologists made a case for the ACE inhibitors to actually be protective. And um, the reality is uh, we are quite reassured that probably these drugs are not harmful because the observational evidence we have didn't show uh, any hint that patients who were long-term on ACE inhibitors or ARBs were more exposed to the disease or to severe forms, or to ARDS or to death. Uh, whether we should put patients on ACE inhibitors or ARBs is being explored by randomized trial. There's one uh, trial that's ongoing in Paris uh, called ASOR2 that's led by uh, our colleague Gilles Montalesco that will shed more light on this. And I know that similar trials are ongoing in Europe and in the US. Uh, for the time being, I think the clear advice for patients who treat hypertension with ACE inhibitors or inhibitors discontinue your treatment because that is definitely deleterious. So do absolutely do not discontinue treatment. It might even be protective, if anything. So I think that's reassuring news uh, for uh, cardiac patients. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for sharing these amazing insights. Um, as a conclusion, I, I would like to ask you about the impact of COVID pandemia and all the efforts to fight it on non-COVID research, particularly on hold for several months now with limited indication, at least in my institution, that it will be you know, started again in the near future. Yes, you know, this is, this is an, a very, very important point. We are facing with something that uh, is unprecedented. I think the word unprecedented has been used in an unprecedented fashion in the past few weeks. Uh, it's, it's a once in a century event. Uh, the last time was really uh, the Spanish flu exactly a century ago. Um, and it's, it's quite hard to predict the future, as Yogi Berra used to say. So we don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's been challenging to develop COVID research because of the uh, transient nature of the epidemic. And in fact, now that the first wave is getting past us, many of the studies that we have started for COVID are stranded, unfinished and uncompleted. And we know that in pandemics, this is often the case. You start off 10 trials and only two complete and provide results. And we have to live with that. And it's, it's very, very frustrating. To at least that last two, three months do not provide the proper time and number of patients to complete all of the studies we would like to complete. We certainly hope that the pandemic is not coming back and that we're not going to have a second wave or, or patients coming back. However, we know they may come back. It may happen. It may happen in six weeks. It may happen during the fall. It may happen next year. There's a lot of debate in this. Again, I'm not an expert. And from what I understand, Nobody really knows if this is going to come back or not. In the interim, what has happened in non-COVID research is that everything has been stranded. It's been stranded because research personnel have been entirely di diverted to COVID research and all of the efforts have been diverted to COVID research. It's been an incredible effort by research institutions to put all of their might in one field for a few weeks but it also means that non-COVID research is completely stranded. Patients are not coming back to institutions for their visits. They're not coming back to take their boxes of treatments if they require long-term treatment. We are not collecting appropriately or as we should uh, side effects and uh, adverse events and uh, uh, even outcome events. Because so we'll have a lot of catch up to do. And I think that we cannot afford to wait uh, for several weeks or several months to know what's happening in COVID before we resume our non-COVID research. I think there is an urgent need to resume non-COVID research now uh, for all the reasons I alluded to, the safety of the patient, 
uh, not jeopardizing our efforts. And we know that in clinical trials, the worst thing that can happen is to have a stop and go phenomenon. You stop, you start again, you stop, you start again. This actually kills the efforts of clinical trials. And so we had to stop, everybody understand, understands that we, we've had to stop, but I think it's now urgent to resume non-COVID research, just as it is urgent for us as clinicians to resume treatment of non-COVID diseases in our patients. And we know that cardiac patients have been gone from institutions for a few weeks, but we know they are out there, they're sick, they deserve care, and we are very concerned with the, uh, uh, the consequences of the COVID epidemic on cardiac patients uh, that might be sicker now that have, they've been waiting for care, uh, fearing to come to the hospital or to their doctor. And so just like we're saying to patients, come back, we're ready to treat you. I think in non-COVID research, we have to get back to work and restart our clinical trials. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Gabriel, for these uh, enlightened uh, thoughts and, and strong message. Thank you, really. For all of you listening, I hope you enjoyed this conversation and did learn as much uh, as I did, certainly. Now, we would like to invite you to join again, end of June, because Professor Steg has kindly accepted to open the PCR e-course on uh, Thursday, June 25, with a new update lecture on the status of uh, COVID trials. So be sure to connect, and in the meanwhile, stay safe. Thank you again, Gabriel. Thank you, my pleasure.